Since my student days, I'd been closely interested in events in Vietnam. The war and its consequences was one of the great issues of our time, and going there seemed more of a privilege than a duty. The main difficulty in Vietnam was that, for most of the time, we were a long way from the war. The North Vietnamese were trying to invade the South. They had tanks and a good deal of equipment, but to my surprise, I learnt that tanks cannot be driven for long distances. They are usually taken on tank transporters, and the communists did not have them. As a consequence, their great offensive of 1972 was stalled in the northern province of Quang Tri, hundreds of miles from Saigon, where most of the journalists were based. For much of the time, we had no idea what was going on. Our sources were often limited to a South Vietnamese army briefing, which took place each afternoon and was known as the Four O'clock Follies. We had to decide, on behalf of our news organisations, whether to report the claims being made about the conduct of the war. It gave us an odd sense of power. The BBC's position was, as usual, different from that of other journalists. We had far more influence than most other news organisations, because, as well as broadcasting on the World Service and domestic bulletins at home, there was also a Vietnamese language service. Which meant that my broadcasts, translated into Vietnamese, could be heard right across the country. The BBC reporter I took over from, Bob Friend, had been alarmed to be woken in the middle of the night by armed members of the South Vietnamese security services. It was not clear why they were behaving in such an aggressive fashion, until it was eventually traced back to a new translator at Bush House in London. He had made the mistake in translating the phrase "the South Vietnamese government claim" into "the South Vietnamese government boast." Luckily, this had been sorted out, but it still made me ultra cautious. It was a strange period in the war known as Vietnamization. The Americans had not withdrawn, but they had no intention of sustaining any more casualties than they needed to. On arrival, it was necessary to become an accredited war correspondent with the U.S. forces. I was rather unnerved to find that I would be given the honorary rank of major in the U.S. Army, with an identity card in Vietnamese to prove it. I was not sure whether this would help if I fell into the hands of the Viet Cong. Communications with the outside world were primitive. I could use a teleprinter to send copy. And there was a radio circuit to London, but usually only once a week. This involved climbing up the dark staircase of a tower block, and then using bricks as stepping stones to cross an attic flooded by rain to where a rusty microphone stood out from one of the walls. Water swirled about your feet. The voices from London were not always sympathetic. The Army of the Republic of Vietnam was doing surprisingly well. Sometimes through unconventional means, one of the stories I covered was a scheme which provided free televisions and fridges for those soldiers who agreed to stay in the front line. But there were also terrible mistakes. The worst I saw occurred on the eighth of June, nineteen seventy-two, at the village of Trang Bang on Highway One. It provided one of the most notorious images of the Vietnam War. I was with John Swain of the Daily Mail, driving along the highway when we passed a convoy of government troops and could see South Vietnamese aircraft making bombing runs down the road on the edge of a village. The government forces clearly thought the area had been infiltrated by the Viet Cong. We were told that three South Vietnamese soldiers had been burnt by napalm dropped near them by mistake. It was only when we returned to Saigon that we heard the full story. A nine-year-old girl called Kim Phuc had been caught in the exploding napalm. She ran naked down the road as the flaming chemical burnt her skin. The image of her as a terrified young girl caught up in an awful war stirred up emotions around the world. A famous moment caught on camera appeared to sum up the entire Vietnam War. Yet for us, it had seemed no more than a small, unpleasant incident, which otherwise we would have quickly forgotten. When, after six weeks, my tour of duty ended, I was very proud, briefly, to have covered the war in Vietnam.
For most of the 1970s, I joined a disparate group of journalists who would gather in unlikely places to reform old friendships and rivalries. We were the International Press Corps, without whom there could be serious events, but not a big news story. Cyprus in 1974 became very big news indeed. Following a military coup by a group which favoured union with Greece, it was invaded by the Turks and has effectively been partitioned ever since. I was not fully aware of how the same reporters were following each other around the world until one night we were in a group in Nicosia, crossing the Green Line, as it's called, separating the Greek and Turkish sides. Some shots rang out, and a reporter shouted, Bao Chi! Bao Chi! It was the Vietnamese for journalist, which was completely meaningless to those who might be shooting at us, but there were enough of us there who thought it was funny. The coup, which was supported by the military junta then ruling Greece, had triggered fears of a Turkish response, and that was why I had been sent. There were a large number of expatriates living in Cyprus. Some of them behaved as if they were still in charge, and were referred to as the ancient Brits. One of them invited a group of fellow expats to come out onto their verandas and have some fun with the reporter who had arrived from the BBC. Waving his gin and tonic, this ancient Brit roared with laughter and pointed at me. He seems to think there'll be a war or something. The very next morning, 40,000 Turkish troops landed in the north of the island. Back in my room at the Laidra Palace Hotel, I was woken by shouting. Running onto the roof, we could see the sky to the north filled with parachutes and the hills above Kyrenia scorched with flames. Despite my efforts with the head porter, it was impossible to make a phone call. It was the biggest story of my journalistic life, and I could not get in touch with the office. The old hands, remarkably cool, began filling their baths with water in case supplies ran out. Greek Cypriot forces dragged machine guns onto the roof and started firing into the Turkish sector. To give them cover, they decided we should stay with them. For the next 36 hours, we were kept cooped up in the hotel, bunched together in the staircase well. It was months later when I heard how close we had come to being killed. The machine gun nest on the roof was the most effective sign of Greek resistance. It was decided that the Lydra Palace should be bombed from the air, and I was told by Turkish Cypriot sources that their planes were already on the way when they were called back. It was argued that putting the lives of 200 international journalists at risk would not help their cause. This did not stop Turkish forces closer to the hotel opening up with small arms fire. The noise was deafening, and terrified I broke my five-year ban on smoking and had one last cigarette. The BBC World Service provided the only light relief. In perfect quality, we could listen to round the horn. It didn't seem quite as funny as usual. Canadian forces operating under the UN eventually freed us, and we were taken to the British base at Decalia, where we were soon queuing up to make phone calls. I was not shy to use every ounce of influence. Please let me jump the queue, I said. My fellow journalists knew that if I was on the radio, everyone would know we were safe, and within minutes my dispatch was being transmitted on the six o'clock news. The BBC generally were in very poor spirits because an ITN reporter, Michael Nicholson, had pulled off a remarkable scoop. He had filmed and then interviewed Turkish paratroopers when they landed in northern Cyprus. Impressed though I was by this feat, I was in no mood to try to emulate his success. There was a call to arms from Simon Dring, a television reporter who had just arrived. He announced that his task was to recover the BBC's reputation. I went with Simon Dring on a visit to the north arranged by the Turkish authorities. He gave me a lift back and told me and the crew that we would not be going back to Nicosia. He intended to break through to the west and cross the front line at the village of Lapitos. Well, in that case, I said firmly, you can drop me at the next corner. He arrived at the hotel later, having been turned back by the Turkish army. Soon after, I left for home. A week later I was asleep in our new home in Ealing when the phone woke me. It was the BBC. One of our people had been killed in Cyprus 
and would I go back there straight away? We needed to send reinforcements to keep up morale. Taking a deep breath, I said yes. The awful news was soon broadcast. Ted Stoddart, a sound man with a BBC television crew, had been killed in a minefield on the front line west of Kyrenia. The reporter Simon Dring and the cameraman were unhurt. A BBC radio reporter, Christopher Morris, had been injured. I asked where they had been going and was told, oh, they were on their way to Lapitos. That afternoon I was one of only two passengers standing on the tarmac at the military airfield at Lynham in Wiltshire. The other was the television news editor, John Exelby. His task was to bring back Ted Stoddart's body. It was a strange scene. In a cloudless sky, high above the south of France, sitting in the cockpit of an empty RAF VC-10, we listened to the denouement of the Watergate affair. It was President Nixon's last broadcast from the White House. Leslie Stone afterwards provided the BBC comment. I was so impressed. If only, I mused momentarily, I could become one of the BBC's political experts and give up trying to be a war correspondent. I was not sure it really suited me. In Nicosia we checked into the Hilton Hotel. I opened the door to the room allotted to me and realised immediately that something was wrong. The previous occupant had not checked out. His clothes and equipment were lying about. I closed the door quickly and went back to reception, a wave of nausea sweeping over me. It was Ted Stoddart's room. Eventually I was allowed home. A Canadian Hercules aircraft lifted off from RAF Akrotiri with me as the sole passenger. It took seven hours to fly to Germany, and feeling like a less handsome version of James Bond, I changed into my best lightweight suit before landing, and strolled off looking cleaner and smarter than I had for weeks. I drove to Frankfurt and stayed in the best hotel. I have never felt more relieved. Coming home there was an extra delight. William Peter Sargent had been born the previous November. He was the perfect antidote to my intense life at the BBC. In April 1975, the BBC decided that I should fill in as Washington correspondent for a month. I leapt at the chance. The main correspondent was a delightful, humorous, hard-working Welshman called Angus McDermott. The television correspondent could have fitted the same description. John Humphreys, later the famous voice of the Today programme. The first call came in at about five o'clock in the morning. It was Helen Wilson, the duty producer, phoning from New York. The Americans, she told me, were leaving Vietnam. It is a curious feature of reporting in Washington that the people who go to the news conferences are often the more junior members of the staff. Those who have to do the real work stay in the office, watching it on television. They can then react far more quickly in transmitting the news back home. It was therefore to be expected that Angus McDermott should be left at the BBC office while I was allowed to go to the White House. As I was arriving, the Secretary of State, Henry Kissinger, turned up. There was an undeniable sense of history being made. Angus and I dominated the Today programme that morning. When you are an inexperienced reporter, listening to the coverage of these sorts of events can be intimidating. But the truth is that the big stories usually write themselves. One's adrenaline is flowing, and because they are events millions of people are interested in, they do not require very subtle handling. I think we did quite well that morning. John Humphreys lived with his family in the Maryland suburbs, in a vast house surrounded by a large, unused plot of land. On Sunday, he invited me over for a barbecue, and I appreciated how Middle America had changed since I had been there as a student. Californian wine was now marketed as if it were cider in jugs. John invited me to play snooker in the basement with a jug of white wine for company. This should have set off more than one alarm bell. Drinking and playing snooker is, for me anyway, not a good idea. And why did it not occur to me that anyone who has a full-size snooker table in their basement is likely to keep on top form. What was worse is that I caught him cheating. I have told this story in front of large audiences 
when John Humphreys has been present, and at the reference to cheating, there's usually a large intake of breath. Calm is only restored when I explain that he was cheating in my favour, altering the score on the board so that I should not seem so far behind. It was the beginning of a long friendship. On my return home, there was the growing excitement of the imminent birth of our second child. I was present at the birth in the Middlesex Hospital. Late on a Sunday night, quickly and marvellously, Michael John Sargent arrived. Our family was now complete. During my many trips abroad, it was always interesting to work out who had gained most from the experience, me or the BBC. If conditions were all full and especially if they were dangerous, then the BBC would quickly be ahead on points. But often the places and the people would be of such interest, irrespective of the story, that I would begin to believe that I was edging ahead. Take Cairo. Walking along in the narrow streets, playing with my new and very expensive radio, what could be more riveting than suddenly hearing one's own voice broadcasting on the medium wave relayed in Cyprus? This was clearly a trip I could enjoy and easily win my unofficial contest with the BBC. But, and there is always a qualification of some kind, this was Christmas, 1977, and I was away from my two small boys and from my wife. The staff at the Cairo Hilton, who gave no impression of being Christians, had decided to embrace the festival, no doubt encouraged by the idea that it meant more days off. Carols were piped over the music system and a bedraggled Father Christmas adorned a plastic tree. To keep up my morale, the newspeople at Broadcasting House had spoken in terms of privilege and history. You are, I was told, privileged to be covering a story which will affect the history of the Middle East. Unfortunately, I could not dispute either of those claims. This was a momentous period. Just over a month before, the Egyptian president, Anwar Sadat, had surprised the world by announcing that he would be prepared to go to the Israeli parliament to make a direct appeal for peace between their two countries. Senat's visit had been a great success. Now it was the turn of the Israeli Prime Minister Menachem Begin to come to Egypt. The meeting between Sadat and Begin took place by the Suez Canal at Ismailia. Lines of satellite trucks were parked alongside several vast tents and it was here that I would spend Boxing Day. Relations between politicians and the media are often a cause of frustration and hostility, but the truth is that they need each other. On that tented site in the desert, this was more obvious than usual. It became apparent that the two leaders had very little to say at this stage. The importance was in the symbolism of their meeting on Egyptian soil. I was given a clear signal by one of the officials in Begin's office. What is the story? I asked him bluntly. You are the story, he replied. The fact that you are all here reporting their meeting. This could give momentum to the search for peace. In less than a year, the Camp David Accords were signed, paving the way for the peace agreement between Israel and Egypt. However, it did not resolve the conflict between the Israelis and the other Arab states. All this was brought sharply to my attention a few months after I returned to London. A terrorist attack in Israel had convinced my news editor that there might be a military response across the border into southern Lebanon. I flew to Israel and drove to the northernmost part of the country, to the small town of Matula. I went into one of the small hotels for a drink. So you've got here at last, was the greeting I received. It was from John Beerman one of the toughest and best BBC television correspondents, sitting further along in the bar. Did you see the troops on either side of the road coming up here? He continued. I had not seen anything unusual, and not for the first time with John I felt inadequate. They can't be kept in a state of readiness for much longer, he went on. They'll have to strike soon, or they'll have to stand them down. Soon after midnight we saw the result. From the top of our hotel, we could see the tracer bullets lighting up the darkness inside southern Lebanon. Then the big camouflaged guns opened up from a field a short distance away. My report, complete with sound effects, appeared on the morning news bulletin on Radio 4. 
Very soon after this, we heard a shout that during the 1970s I learnt to dread. Incoming, incoming. It was a warning of shell fire from the other side. I jumped into what appeared to be a bomb shelter. Cowering inside, I was dismayed to read on all the boxes piled up there, high explosive. I'd managed to take cover in an ammunition store. I began to think increasingly that being a foreign correspondent might not be the answer at all, and that it was time to turn my passion for politics into a new stage of my career. The first politician I came to know just happened to be Prime Minister, and the only reason for our meeting was in case something untoward happened to him. If the Prime Minister had been shot, I would have been thrust into prominence, explaining what had happened, and be asked to speculate why the tragedy had occurred. I was on what journalists sometimes call the death watch. But despite this macabre context, my contact with the Prime Minister developed into a useful and amusing introduction to politics at the highest level. And for that, I must thank Sir Edward Heath. At the beginning of 1974, sharply rising oil prices had combined with a bitter dispute with the miners. Industry had been forced to work a three-day week in order to save energy, and Mr Heath decided that the only way out was to ask the electorate a simple question. Who governs Britain? After a few weeks, it was clear that the tactic had not worked. The electorate were in no mood to answer a question of that sort. They wanted to get on with the untidy business of a normal election campaign. The final result was muddled. Mr Heath was robbed of his majority and could only have governed with liberal support, which was not forthcoming. The Labour leader, Harold Wilson, won the February election by default, and with a tight majority, the second general election of 1974, which followed in October. It was not my intention to choose the losing side. In the first election, I was given the choice as to which party leader I would like to follow, and I thought it would be more fun to be with the person who was running the country. It would then have seemed churlish to give up my contacts with the Conservatives and switch to Labour. So, in less than a year, I was able to observe first a Prime Minister, then a leader of the opposition, fight for his political life. My strange role, whereby I would only come into my own if something awful happened to Ted Heath, had an extremely beneficial effect on my relations with the Prime Minister. It was not part of my brief to try to trick him into off-the-record remarks that could be blown up into tabloid headlines. He seemed more able to relax with me than with the political correspondence. I tended to ask him questions about matters not particularly relevant to the election campaign, often to do with Europe. Propping up the bar of a country pub, he might be asked to discourse on subjects like why shouldn't we be allowed to protect our industries from foreign competition, and if not, how could we be sure that the economy would grow? He would take great pains to answer, showing no impatience but having to explain the advantages of free trade. The most striking lesson he taught me was the sheer grind of being a senior politician, how much energy was required. It seemed that one needed an obsessive interest in the myriad different issues on which the government might have to take a view. How else could one explain a Prime Minister at the end of a campaigning day relaxing by discussing the disadvantages of import controls? But there was another more uncomfortable truth. There was quite a large part of me that also found it relaxing to discuss the disadvantages of import controls at the end of a campaigning day. It was undoubtedly during the election campaigns of 1974 that the seed of my future career was sown. Mr Heath's relatively brief period in office only came to an end after a confusing few days following the declaration of the results. He had agreed to give me the first interview on the evening of polling day. It was in a school hall of the Bexley constituency. David Dimbleby was established at one end on what looked to me like a throne. I felt very much the poorer relation, with a microphone trailing back to a radio link. But without hesitation, Mr Heath kept his word. The photographers were waved aside. The first interview would be with me. I was so excited that it took me some time to realise how little he had actually said. Then it was back to Downing Street, 
and the beginning of a long night. After Mr. Heath left office, he found it easier to relax and was happy to spend time reminiscing. When Mary and I were invited to lunch at his home in Belgravia, he introduced me as John Sargent, who was in charge of the BBC. One of his stories related to a particularly difficult Commonwealth conference. At last they had agreed a final communique, which stressed, among other things, the evils of racial discrimination. Then the delegate from Fiji put up his hand. "'What's the matter?' Mr. Heath asked Crossley. "'Well,' the delegate replied, "'you don't understand. "'We believe in racial discrimination.' After the election of October 1974, I went back to general reporting duties. But there were occasions when I returned to the political world. One of the stars of Howard Wilson's government was Barbara Castle, and she taught me the importance of toughness in a political leader. As the minister responsible for health and social security, she worked in an ugly tower block just south of the Thames. Having arrived for an interview with a television crew early in the evening, Mrs. Castle greeted us briefly, holding a gin and tonic, and then swept into the lift to take us upstairs. We shot up to the seventh floor, but instead of stopping, the lift suddenly reversed and descended to the basement. It did not stop there. Immediately it reached the bottom, the lift automatically went right back up to the top of the building. It had a life of its own, and the process could not be halted. We were trapped. If we are going to die... Mrs. Castle announced. We may as well share the drink. She waved the gin and tonic at the small group of men. No one took up her offer. A private secretary wrenched out the emergency phone and began dialing as the lift continued its crazy passage up and down the building. Who are you phoning? Mrs. Castle demanded. I'm phoning our office, the hapless official replied. Well, there'll be no one there, said the Secretary of State. She then quickly devised a plan. When we next reached the bottom of the building, we would pull the emergency stop. This was done to a collective sigh of relief, and we managed to prise open the lift door. When we staggered out into the gloomy basement, one of the television crew made immediately for the staircase. Mrs. Castle would have none of that. Come on, she said firmly, and strode into the adjoining lift. We've got to get on, she declared, and pressed the button for the seventh floor. It was, in its own way, a remarkable display of courage and leadership. At various times towards the end of the 1970s, I was judged by senior members of the BBC management either to be the perfect person to be the main London presenter of Radio 4's Today programme, or, alternatively, a failed political correspondent. Sitting alone in the studio at Broadcasting House, with Brian Redhead on top form burbling away in Manchester, it was obvious to many people that I was out of my depth. After three months, I was told that my chance was over. Having been very much on the up, I was now very definitely on the way down. Oh, well, I thought, at least I will be able to go to Westminster and become a political correspondent. Within a few months, a vacancy occurred, and it was only then that I realised how serious my decline had become. My main rival, David Koss, had worked with me on the Liverpool Echo, later moving into the BBC's unit at Westminster. Ominously, he was invited to meet the Director-General, Ian Trethowan, for lunch. I was not included. At the interview board, the political editor, David Holmes, gave the impression that he was not on my side. Needless to say, David Koss got the job. In a smaller organisation, this setback could have sounded the death knell to my career, but one of the great joys of the BBC is that new alliances can be formed if old ones fail. To succeed, though, you need patrons. And on this occasion, a senior news executive, Andrew Todd, came to my aid. He believed I had been treated unfairly and announced that my salary would be paid for a year in any part of the BBC that could be persuaded to take me on. Partly out of devilment and partly to show my determination, the office where I chose to work produced a weekly television programme called The Week in Westminster for BBC Two. David Holmes presented it. He found to his irritation that having rejected me one week, the next I was firmly ensconced on his pet project. Having said I would help in any way, 
I ended up making short films and even did some presenting in the studio. My rehabilitation was underway. It was a good time to be working on this sort of programme, as the Labour government staggered through the season of industrial disputes, which became known as the Winter of Discontent, and headed towards the election of 1979. But when the contest began, the week in Westminster was closed down for the duration. My loyal friends in radio jumped at the chance to get me back. I was asked once again to cover the election tour of the leader of the opposition, with this time a good chance of being on the winning side. If the Conservatives succeeded, Britain would have its first woman Prime Minister. A veteran of both Mr Heath's election battles, joining Mrs Thatcher's campaign tour in 1979 made me feel like an old hand. But the differences were very marked. There would be no late-night visits to pubs, no lengthy discussions on arcane policy matters. Mrs Thatcher had none of the old-fashioned sociability which many senior Conservatives wallowed in. There was no attempt to pretend that she was a man in woman's clothing and she made little secret of her interest in good-looking men. Feminism as a political force seemed to pass her by. She was the most successful woman in the country, and she implied that if she could achieve what she had without special help, then other women could do likewise. Mrs Thatcher was determined to come over well on television. The BBC's television correspondent was Michael Cole, an extremely skilful reporter who once memorably replied to an editor, asking him to cut down a piece to 45 seconds, Look, I could give you the whole history of the First World War in 45 seconds, but it might lose some of its subtlety. The ITN correspondent was the super-confident Michael Bronson. Mrs Thatcher referred to them as the two Michaels, and I was disconcerted to see how much attention she lavished on them. As the BBC radio correspondent, my difficulty was that more of the campaign was designed for television than in any previous election. Mr Heath had gone walkabouts, but it was nothing like the whirlwind whipped up by Mrs Thatcher. As she rushed around a factory, she would suddenly stop in front of some electronic device. The cameras would be summoned, and she would then adopt the stance of a presenter on Tomorrow's World. A brief lecture would follow, then she would sweep on. There was a briskness about it all, which at times seemed excessive. We are not, I would complain to colleagues, trying to learn how to run a factory. On one memorable occasion, we all had to wear white coats and surgical masks to tour a chocolate-making plant. Board operatives would turn round for a moment, only to find that Mrs Thatcher had taken their place and was working furiously on the production line. It was designed to show how much energy she had, and after the first week, I was in no mood to disagree. She also wanted to show that she could be the boss. In a distant part of Scotland, our touring bus got stuck in the mud, and she immediately ordered us to get out and start pushing. We managed to get the bus going in time to reach our next destination, a kipper processing plant. Mrs Thatcher was shown how to make sure that the herrings were fresh. Look at their eyes, see that they are not bloodshot, she was told, and then give them a good sniff. It's the only way. It made splendid television. The Conservatives won the election with a majority of 43 seats. Mrs Thatcher's first interview as Prime Minister was given to me at Tory Central Office in the early hours of the following morning. With her husband and two children, Mrs Thatcher was standing on the main staircase, while I was stuck at the back of a large crowd. Dignity is not an issue on such occasions. I crawled at great speed through the legs of the assembled throng. It was not the most illuminating of my interviews with Mrs Thatcher, but it captured the mood. It was the start of eleven controversial years in office. One might think that reporting is more of a trade than a profession, less an art than a task which has to be completed, usually within the constraints of a tight deadline. It should be easy to pick out those who do it well and those who do it less well. All that is true, but fashion plays a part as well. Much would depend in the BBC on the latest whims of management. One of the most persistent of these throughout my time with the corporation was a fashion for Europe. The constant cry from the bosses was that we must do more on Europe.
The British establishment wants to get to grips with European institutions, and they wanted the BBC to play its part. What was later called the democratic deficit had to be filled, and this was where I came in. One of the senior BBC managers, Gerard Slassinger, was sent to find me at Television Centre. We want you, he said without preamble, to be responsible for covering the European Parliament. He did not wait for my reply. If you don't accept, you will have to go back into the reporter's pool at Broadcasting House. I struggled to make a comment. But I would like to accept. He looked at me firmly and repeated the warning. But, I tried again, I would like to cover the European Parliament. Among BBC management there was a distinct lack of interest in how I might carry out my task. I was given a series of producers, many of them brilliant and all good companions. One later became famous as the BBC's legal correspondent Joshua Rosenberg. Our first hurdle was to work out a way to make the contributions in ten languages work in radio terms. Translators were on hand, but they could sound very monotonous. We needed to make sure that at all times we had a recording of the speaker and of the simultaneous translation. Joshua was dispatched to the electronic shops in Tottenham Court Road and returned triumphant with a desktop stereo cassette recorder. On one track we would record the speaker and on the other would be the translation. We would be able to fade from one to another, or at least that was the theory. We were slightly apprehensive when we had to plug in for the first time in our small office, which overlooked the floor of the European Parliament. The 81 British members were split up between the European parties, with Labour and their leader Barbara Castle sitting on the left, and the Tories, led by Sir James Scott Hopkins, on the centre-right. It was a good turnout, and unusually for the European Parliament, the debate was fairly lively. That was until Joshua plugged in our equipment. For a few minutes we had no idea what had gone wrong. The debate seemed to have stalled. MEPs were taking off their headphones and shaking their heads. It was apparent that the Parliament would have to be suspended. Then came the awful realisation that our wonderful equipment bought with such pride in Tottenham Court Road, had torpedoed the workings of the European community. Quickly, and rather shamefacedly, we pulled out the plugs, and order was instantly restored. Instead of hearing simultaneous translations in all ten languages, the MEPs could once again follow what was being said. If only their deliberations had lived up to the importance they attached to them, I came to the conclusion that in politics, as in architecture, the Renaissance idea of man as the measure of all things holds sway. The European Parliament is too far removed from the experience of ordinary people, and even those of us who travelled there each month for two years found it an unsatisfying experience. I was the first, and as it turned out, the last full-time BBC correspondent devoted to the European Parliament. Like someone in middle age, unless some discipline is exerted, the BBC will put on weight. This means adding extra staff. There was also a tendency, very much encouraged under the leadership of John Burt, to create a parallel BBC. There would be a strong body of people who made the programmes and a quite separate line of managers who would contrive to lead interesting lives without ever having to connect with the stressful business of broadcasting. The Director-General, the underrated Alastair Milne, said that at any hour of any day, someone in the BBC with little talent was trying to stop someone with more talent from getting on with the job. His duty was to find out where this was happening and make sure that those with more talent were allowed to proceed. To me, this drag on the BBC's skills seemed rather like a branch of particle physics. There was talent and there was anti-talent. Encouraging the talent was relatively easy. Keeping control of the anti-talent was far more difficult. One of the central problems is working out what should be the proper disposition of staff in the corporation. The fear of overstaffing produces a clampdown on the numbers officially on the books. But quite often, there is a raft of extra people who have somehow managed to end up working there anyway. 
It might simply be a matter of bringing people in on contract. There are also people on attachments from other parts of the BBC. Then there are the very rare cases where the decision to give someone a post has never been formally taken by an interview board. And it was into this category that I fell in a rather ungainly fashion. I was fortunate that my old friend John Simpson had replaced David Holmes as political editor. He was the vital ally in my time of need. John phoned me in Paris to ask me what I really wanted to do. To go to Westminster, was my immediate reply. Isn't that odd, he replied. I would like to be in Paris. He then explained that there was a move afoot which would change my official position. When I was put in charge of European Parliament coverage, I had, in the jargon of management, been seconded to a vacant Westminster post. This was because, although I had failed to become a political correspondent, I had been deemed also suitable by the interview board held the year before. Well, can't you just now make me a political correspondent? I asked. I will do what I can, said John, and he arranged for me to be switched officially to the political staff. I had gained a vital toehold in the Westminster office. Soon after, John Simpson left Westminster to present the nine o'clock news with John Humphreys. This left a vacancy for a new political editor, which was to be filled by John Cole, whose strong Belfast accent and herringbone coat would help to make him a legendary figure. He could not take over immediately. There would be a gap of a month or so, and that gave me an opportunity. Surely I could help fill the gap in those weeks in which I was not covering the European Parliament. I went to see the Director of News and Current Affairs, Alan Prothero. He was credited with extreme tenacity, particularly when dealing with complaints from political parties. He was also credited with a marvellous comment when the BBC had lurched into some crisis or other. Well, he declared, assistant heads must roll. He listened to my proposal with surprise and finally impatience. If you are a political correspondent, he said, of course you should be allowed to go to Westminster. He then picked up the most recent staff list. It looked like a small telephone directory. Look, he said, there's your name, and what does it say? Political correspondent. Tell them I've agreed. What Alan Prothero did not know was how badly this would go down with the Westminster staff. There was the fear that before long I would want to drop my role as European Parliament correspondent and begin to rise up through the ranks of Westminster. I was assured that this was not personal, but I could not help but be upset when the correspondents sent a round robin to the management urging them not to move me to Westminster. But I now had the backing of Alan Prothero, and I also had a good argument. They were short of staff, at least for the time being, and I was only offering to help. There was an icy atmosphere when I turned up. There were times when I dreaded going up the short flight of steps from the lift and opening the small door of the office. I had no desk. I would sit in an armchair with my briefcase. But I did have considerable advantages over my colleagues in terms of broadcasting experience and an academic grounding in politics and economics. And if they wanted to treat me like an unpopular boy at school, they would soon learn that I had some playground skills as well. My first task was to get on well with the head boy, John Cole. On arrival, he was told about the sergeant problem, which he later admitted he found mystifying. It was not obvious from the beginning that John Cole and I would turn out to be such close colleagues and friends. I had some obvious drawbacks. My public school and Oxford background did not mesh with his more impressive rise, the son of an electrician who learnt his trade as a teenager on local papers in Northern Ireland. I did, however, have some plus points. I had been a reporter of the conflict, which mattered more to John than any other political subject. John, the Protestant Ulsterman, was highly sensitive to the dangers of making comments about the situation which might be misconstrued. At least I had the advantage over my colleagues in that I knew the pitfalls. I had, to use the phrase he would invariably use, served in Northern Ireland. I also had the advantage of being much younger than John. We competed a good deal, as would any correspondents working on the same patch, but the age difference meant that we were not competing over his role in the BBC. When I had to make a speech at one of his many retirement parties, I said that I had learnt to play Sergeant Lewis 
to his Inspector Morse, and that wasn't entirely a joke. John's appointment as political editor marked a sea change in the way that British politics is reported on television. Up to this point, most of the emphasis was on balance. The easiest piece to write was to say that the Tories had said something, that Labour had disagreed, and that the Liberals had said they were both wrong. The BBC would stay loftily out of the argument, but John introduced a more sophisticated approach, with a degree of proper comment that went further than any of his predecessors. He would try to answer the more difficult questions of why something was being said, and if tactics were revealed, what their chances of success might be. He would put the argument into context, and often refer to previous conflicts of a similar sort. John took a delight in discussing the struggle for power behind the scenes. For many viewers, he was providing all the missing bits, which in the past the newspapers alone had delivered. My start as a political correspondent at the BBC may have been uneasy, but my time at Westminster was to become the most important part of my journalistic career. As every parent knows, there is no perfect way to bring up children. Also, as every parent knows, all you can do is to try to do your best. I attempted to shield my two sons from distress and to keep my word. Sometimes that policy had strange effects. When I went to Northern Ireland, I promised to bring them back Star Wars toys, which were then all the rage. I kept my word, but did not dwell on other aspects of life and death in Northern Ireland. As a result, at the height of the terrorist violence, my two little boys would jump up and down and say, Daddy, Daddy, why don't you go to Belfast again? I also promised to take them swimming each week at the municipal baths in Harrow. Each Sunday, whatever my other engagements, I would sit groggily beside the pool, wondering just how this promise had been extracted. Protesting about tiredness and jet lag cut no ice with two determined small boys. It is often forgotten how difficult Margaret Thatcher found her first period in government. She nearly doubled VAT, she put up taxes when the country was in recession, and she was not fully in charge of her cabinet. What she needed to guarantee success in the next election was a good war. But when it came in 1982, I was trapped by another promise to my two sons. All those outings to Harrow had paid off. They were both competent swimmers. But at some point in their long swimming training, I had promised them that were they to succeed, I would buy them a boat. At the Earl's Court Boat Show, we bought the mirror dinghy on display. We called it Lois Lane. For weeks we had planned to make our first sail on Saturday the 2nd of April. But the day before, the Falkland Islands had been invaded by Argentina. For the first time in recent history, it was decided that the House of Commons would meet on a Saturday to debate the crisis. When an appeal was made for volunteers to work on that day, I stayed mysteriously silent. There were more than enough correspondents willing to take part. But it did take some of the shine off the inaugural sale of Lois Lane, but afterwards I was more than anxious to do my bit to cover the conflict. The Falklands War is an interesting example of how a partisan press, anxious to please the government of the day, would not have produced the desired effect. To start with, everything seemed to go wrong. The Argentine government were given the impression that Britain would not attempt to retake the islands. When the invasion came, the authorities in London were taken completely by surprise. All three foreign office ministers including the highly regarded Lord Carrington, resigned. The military sent a task force to the South Atlantic, which would recapture the islands and do so with a surprisingly small number of casualties. Like a wasp in winter, right at the end of the country's long colonial history, Britain was still able to produce a stinging response. It was the making of Mrs Thatcher. But her political victory was only possible because the media had not shrunk from telling the bad news first. For the BBC, the war posed peculiar difficulties. At the heart was the old problem of being fair to both sides, however much these matters might touch the core of the nation's psyche. But they naturally treated news of the missile attack 
on the British destroyer HMS Sheffield as a serious blow to our country's hopes, and it provided me with my one scoop of the war. I will not reveal who my source was that evening. The information was incomplete, but it was clearly important. One of our ships in the South Atlantic had been badly hit. The news would come out at 9 p.m. I immediately informed the newsroom at Television Centre, and when the nine o'clock news started, they went straight over to a news conference at the Ministry of Defence. In his strange, monotonous voice, the MOD's chief spokesman, Ian MacDonald, read out the grim details. The destroyer had been hit by an Argentine Exocet missile and subsequently sank. There were about 40 casualties. When the war was over, the change in Mrs. Thatcher was marked. She had more confidence. She had proved herself as a war leader. And in politics, there is no substitute for success. I had been thankful that for once in my BBC career, I did not have to feel guilty about not being close to the action. I would begin to settle down to a different kind of journalism in Westminster. But life is seldom simple. At the very moment when the course ahead seemed, if anything, too predictable, I was struck down by illness. I could not get out of bed without considerable difficulty. I seemed to be nearly paralysed. All kinds of blood tests were carried out. Each time I was told they were negative. It was only when Mary was struck down in a similar fashion that we had any clue as to what had happened. She tested positive for toxoplasmosis a parasitical infection which can be caught from cats. Our lovely Persian cat Fluffy had to be put down. It is not supposedly an illness which lasts for very long, but with us it lingered on, albeit in a less serious form, for many years. Barbara Castle once told me that one of the most important things in life is to be lucky with your bad luck. Fortunately, I was able to continue my work at Westminster if I had still been a general reporter, I would have had to be switched to other duties. When Margaret Thatcher called the election for June the 9th, 1982, fortunately my role in the forthcoming campaign would be largely sedentary. Most of my work was compiling reports from news conferences and speeches. The morning bulletins on Radio 4 were obviously the most important, and one of my broadcasts inadvertently damaged a politician I rather liked the Foreign Secretary, Francis Pym. He had made the mistake of suggesting on the BBC Question Time programme with Robin Day that he hoped the Conservatives would not win a landslide victory. He said, Landslides, on the whole, don't produce successful governments. To me, this was a great news story. At the start of an election campaign, the Foreign Secretary was suggesting his party should not go all out for a thumping victory. The story was not touched in the newspapers, but my version led the morning radio bulletins. Mrs Thatcher, who did not get on with Francis Pym, was privately furious, but she tried not to show her displeasure at the morning press conference. I think I could manage a landslide majority all right, she insisted, then referred to Mr Pym's natural caution as a former chief whip. However, when Mrs Thatcher came to form her new government after the election, Mr. Pym was dropped. On the day of her successful re-election, Mrs. Thatcher celebrated with Cecil Parkinson. She had it in mind to make him Foreign Secretary, a perfect replacement for Francis Pym. It was only then that her party chairman admitted to an affair with his former secretary, Sarah Keyes, which the Prime Minister revealed later gave her pause. Mrs. Thatcher was not censorious. She was cool about such matters. It was left to Cecil Parkinson to blurt out, but what about Victorian values? But you are going to stay with your wife, Mrs Thatcher replied. Cecil Parkinson was invited to have lunch at number 10 the next day, but before he arrived, there was a dramatic intervention from Sarah Keyes's father. He sent a personal letter to Mrs Thatcher, revealing that his daughter was pregnant with Cecil Parkinson's child. The Prime Minister was surprised, but not deterred. She decided it would not be sensible for him to take up such a sensitive post as Foreign Secretary, but she was determined to have him in her cabinet as the Trade and Industry Secretary. The secret was kept for a few more months. Then the affair was admitted in a joint press statement from Cecil Parkinson and Sarah, issued 
just before the Conservative Party conference. As the most junior political correspondent, I was left in London. It was therefore up to me to stand outside the Department of Trade and Industry and pontificate on whether Cecil Parkinson would be forced to resign. There are many broadcasts which I would be happy to forget. This is one of them. I took the view he would survive, and it is no consolation to read in Mrs. Thatcher's memoirs that at the time she held the same view. John Cole used to remind me that the more significant a story, the more important it is to leave in some weasel words. These can be introduced so as not to interrupt the flow, and when you wake up worrying in the middle of the night, you will be glad they're there. Phrases such as, at this stage, or from what we can gather at the moment, or it looks as though. Any of these phrases is better than an assessment made without qualification in a situation where you cannot know the facts. Over the years, I've also tried to include a further check. It is the one week on test. The idea is to imagine how your remarks will seem a week after they have been broadcast. It stops you saying, this is the most incredible thing that has ever happened, only to discover that a week later the story has been largely forgotten. As a natural communicator, John Cole brought to the BBC a set of fresh skills, as an expert in what is usually called a two-way, or an ITN alive. These are the occasions when the correspondent is asked questions by the newsreader. John had been answering questions like this for many years. The first time I met him, I was asking about the situation in Northern Ireland for the Today programme. He was deputy editor of The Guardian, and that was nearly ten years before he joined the staff of the BBC. John liked the questions to be spontaneous, as well as the answers. This often caused difficulties, because without, I hope, being too unkind, newsreaders tend to be a vain lot. They long to prove they are sentient human beings, and not simply the purveyors of other people's scripts. Questions from newsreaders could often be tortured attempts to cover the ground the correspondent is about to cover, or they could be just plain dark. On one ghastly occasion, a very famous newsreader on the six o'clock news said to me, What has happened this afternoon is very surprising, John. What is the next surprising thing that is going to happen? Despite the fact that one of the best jokes about newsreaders is both unfair and in poor taste, I cannot resist repeating it. Chris Kramer, before he left to become overseas head of the American satellite news operation CNN, was the news editor of BBC Television News. When Martin Lewis left ITN and joined the BBC as a newsreader, Julia Somerville left the BBC for the same job at ITN. Chris gave a snort and announced, tit for tat. None of this deep knowledge about the relationship between correspondents and newsreaders was any help to me as I stood outside the Department of Trade and Industry in October 1983, trying to work out whether Cecil Parkinson would be forced to resign. My assessment that he was unlikely to do so seemed a reasonable assumption, on the basis that there was no obvious pressure on him to go from his colleagues or his constituents. What we had not allowed for was the intervention of the one person who now more than anyone else wanted to encourage his downfall, Sarah Keyes. There was a lot of talk about the dangers of a wronged woman, but there were plenty who were pleased she decided to take her revenge. On the eve of the Conservative Party conference, she gave a long interview to the Times. Cecil Parkinson was whisked away from the Blackpool conference after John Cole had managed to get an exclusive interview with him. He did not return to the Cabinet until after the next election, and any hopes he might have of becoming Prime Minister were finished forever. In the early 1980s, Conservatives were lucky in the general state of the opposition. Michael Foote had proved ineffective as leader, and when the 1983 election was over, he announced he would stand down. I was acquainted with the new Labour leader, Neil Kinnock. We had spent a happy morning making a film for the Westminster programme, and I was struck by his charm and his extraordinary skill in front of a television camera. There were plenty of times later when we were far from chummy particularly when I would try to interview him about the militant tendency 
as he strode through a crowd of reporters outside Labour headquarters. But I did not take the view many people did that he could never become Prime Minister. A divided party, though, does not impress the public. The militant tendency had successfully infiltrated the Labour Party. There was also the left wing in Parliament, and the difficulty of how to cope with the charismatic skills of Tony Benn. At the time of the miners' dispute, Mr Benn was desperately keen to rally support behind Arthur Scargill. Neil Kinnock faced an agonising choice. He did not want to be tarred in the public mind with union militancy. But by seeming to be ambivalent, he attracted the scorn of the Conservatives and the wrath of Labour's powerful left wing. During the miners' strike, I occasionally presented The World This Weekend on Radio 4, and an interview with Tony Benn seemed a useful way to explore Mr Kinnock's dilemma, and perhaps make a bit of news as well. I had always, I thought, got on rather well with Mr Benn. My first contact with him had been in 1971, when the People's Republic of China was allowed into the United Nations. Mr Benn had recently visited China, and I thought he might be able to do a quick telephone interview about the first Chinese ambassador to the UN. I haven't got my notes with me, he replied, but how long do you want? Well, I said, I'm looking for about a minute. When the equipment had been set up, I asked him boldly, what do you think of the man the Chinese have appointed to represent them at the UN? I did not risk trying out my limited pronunciation skills by mentioning his name. Mr. Ben took this in his stride. Not only did he remember the man's name, he spoke it with great confidence and proceeded to give a fluent description. At the end, he came to a perfectly rounded conclusion. Then he said, Well, there you are. Sixty seconds. One minute. I don't have many party tricks, but that's one of them. As a former BBC producer, he could not resist underlining the point. It was an impressive moment. When I set off to my interview with him for the world this weekend, I knew it could not be such a successful encounter. I walked up to the red-painted door of his house in Holland Park with some trepidation. At that time, Mr Ben was making a good deal of the idea that the BBC was a propaganda tool of the government. When he opened the door, I immediately noticed a small tape recorder, which he thrust forward with its red light on, showing that it was recording. Hello, he said. I said hello to the machine. We began negotiations about the coming interview, discussing the questions I might ask. Mr. Ben wants to avoid making a personal attack on Neil Kinnock. I was anxious to point out the fact that he was attacking his own leader, however skillfully disguised that attack might be. I reluctantly agreed that there would be only two questions mentioning Neil Kinnock. I thought that would be enough. But when I asked the two questions, the answers were deliberately vague. Instinctively, I asked a follow-up question, and Mr. Ben exploded. I was, he suggested, an agent of government. He would not continue with the interview. Indeed, he insisted that what we had recorded so far should not be broadcast. This was moving from a skirmish into a serious incident, so I decided to ring my editor, Jenny Abramsky. While she was telling me what she thought, I looked round and saw to my astonishment that Mr. Ben was moving what looked like an electric iron over my tape recorder. In fact, it was a demagnetizing device designed to wipe tapes. The interview was being obliterated. Fortunately, I kept my temper. I left as quickly as I could. I did not bear a grudge against Tony Ben, and later he did apologize, admitting to feeling very strongly. As a political correspondent, you cannot disapprove of politicians with strong convictions. It so often provides grist to your mill. It was an American journalist who invented Spin Doctor as a description of those like Bernard Ingham who put a favourable gloss on the facts to benefit their political masters. But unlike Alastair Campbell, Tony Blair's press secretary, Mr Ingham clung to his status as a civil servant. He had not known Mrs. Thatcher before she arrived at number 10. She had simply asked for the best press secretary in Whitehall, and he was recommended. At one stage, the gruff right-wing Yorkshireman had worked happily with Tony Benn, and it was only after retiring that his political stance became widely known.
the lobby journalists usually have the best opportunity of getting to know the Prime Minister and the Number 10 Press Secretary on trips abroad, and none was more illuminating for me than Mrs Thatcher's visit to the Soviet Union just before the general election in 1987. It was a pivotal moment in relations between the Soviet Union and the West. Mikhail Gorbachev had driven through an astonishing period of reform since becoming Soviet leader. As we gathered at Heathrow for the flight to Moscow, there was still very much of a Cold War atmosphere between the two countries. It was the first visit by a British Prime Minister to the Soviet Union for more than 12 years. The group of journalists were installed at the back of the plane. Conditions were cramped, but we knew that the RAF hospitality would be of a high standard, and soon after takeoff, were assured by Bernard Ingham that we could look forward to our dinner undisturbed. Proper crockery plates, not the usual airline plastic, were laid out, and the main course arrived. At this moment, right behind me, Mrs. Thatcher appeared. I was taken by surprise, and without thinking, stood up. Plates, glasses, and food shot onto the floor. Oh, that's all right, she cooed in her most motherly manner. You stay where you are. She then proceeded to clear up the mess before stewards rushed to her aid. As she rose from the floor, I managed to push a microphone under her chin and, somewhat to her surprise, launched into a long radio interview about the Soviet Union. It was only ended when she rather delicately put her hand over the microphone. But by then, I had Mrs. Thatcher at her best, fluent and interesting. Later, I found myself on the receiving end of her sharp tongue. Looking glamorous in her fox fur Russian hat, she swept about a Moscow housing estate, shaking hands and behaving as if she was running for office. At the top of an apartment block, I had the gall to suggest that maybe she was electioneering. After all, the election in Britain could not be far off. I am, she snapped, simply doing my duty. For a moment, I thought she might push me down the steps. Some weeks later, when she announced that the election would be held in June, I had a burst of satisfaction. A visit to Moscow naturally featured in the Conservative election broadcasts, and Mrs Thatcher became the first leader since Lord Liverpool in the 1820s to win three elections in a row. In the spring of 1988, my career at Westminster began to take off. In the BBC, there can be long periods when there are almost no changes among senior personnel. Then, with the suddenness of an avalanche, the scene changes. It was the arrival of John Burt as Deputy Director General which triggered the changes. It took some time to have an effect. All the political correspondents were interviewed, and at the end of the process, apart from John Cole, I was the only member of the old guard who would stay on. All those who had signed the original round robin against me were told they would be moved on or moved out. It was as if a thunderbolt had struck and somehow I had been spared. When George Bush Sr. paid his first visit to Mrs Thatcher, I was told to go to Downing Street to ask them a question. I was not briefed on what the question might be, but fell back on my usual practice of trying to think up the most difficult question to ask in the politest way possible. I would like to ask the President a question, I started. Don't you want to ask me, Mrs Thatcher interrupted, sensing correctly that a question to her visitor might be more dangerous. You can both answer if you like, I replied. This is the question. Is Britain still America's most important ally in Europe? Everyone in Downing Street knew that the truthful answer was no. Germany was America's most important ally. Mrs. Thatcher moved towards me as if she was physically trying to shield Mr. Bush from the question. After what seemed like an age, he managed to say that Britain and the United States were partners in leadership. Unfortunately, this was exactly what he had said the week before on a visit to West Germany, describing that country's relationship with the United States. It was not what Mrs. Thatcher wanted to hear. In her memoirs, she admits that she was highly concerned that the close cooperation she had established with President Reagan was now being put on ice by Mr. Bush.
When I read this today, it adds to the satisfaction I felt at the time. To go by tube to Westminster, to disconcert the Prime Minister and the American President, and then return quietly to Ealing, must rate as one of my happiest experiences in journalism. For Mrs Thatcher, it was just one more example of how she was endlessly dogged by the problems of European politics. In the same year, it would lead her into sharp disagreement with Foreign Secretary Geoffrey Howe, who was demoted to leader of the House of Commons, and the Chancellor Nigel Lawson, who was forced to resign. For her, it was the beginning of the end. On the day that Mr Lawson resigned, I was having lunch with the new Foreign Secretary, John Major. He was clearly taken aback to learn the extent to which he was now regarded as fair game by the media circus. At the end of the meal, he asked me what my advice would be. It was not a question I expected from a foreign secretary. Be brave, I muttered rather unconvincingly. When we said goodbye, neither of us had any inkling of the dramatic events which were about to unfold. At six o'clock that evening, I was sitting in the BBC studio at Westminster with a telephone clamped to my ear. The editor of the news programme was watching me intently on a monitor at Television Centre. When he puts the phone down, he said to one of his assistants, we'll go straight to John. Luckily, when the call was over, I had Nigel Lawson's resignation statement and was also able to confirm that the new Chancellor would be John Major. From then on, there was a series of events which later seemed like stepping stones, leading inevitably to my dramatic encounter with Mrs Thatcher outside the Paris Embassy. For a political journalist, feeling sorry for a Prime Minister is a strange emotion. John Major would be annoyed to discover that quite often I did indeed feel sorry for him. His problem was that he was not Margaret Thatcher, and for anyone following such a dominant figure, there is inevitably a sense of anticlimax. On many occasions he seemed out of place, even out of his depth, and it is hard to resist the idea that for Mrs Thatcher this made him the perfect successor. John Major's first trip abroad was to Italy to try to repair some of the damage Mrs Thatcher had inflicted on Britain's relations with her allies. She proudly summed up her position with the ringing declaration, No, no, no. All John Major had to do in the atmosphere of relief that greeted his appointment was to say the equivalent of maybe, maybe, maybe. But it was not only the European leaders who were relieved to see the departure of Mrs Thatcher. John Major's appointment was popular with the public and of deep concern to Labour. When he reported to the House of Commons after the summit, I used a split-screen technique to demonstrate his different approach to Europe. On one side of the screen, Mrs Thatcher was seen rejecting out of hand proposals which she saw as moves towards a federal Europe. This faded to reveal Mr Major on the other side giving a much more polite response to the same proposals. Labour were furious. If Mr Major represented change, would the electorate be so keen to vote for the change represented by Mr Kinnock. At the next election we would find out how right Labour were to be worried. John Major surprised many of us by winning. Neil Kinnock took the blame. It seemed that the electorate did not believe he was up to the job. Soon after the election, my own career faltered. John Cole retired as political editor and there was a struggle for succession. Robin Oakley, the political editor of The Times, was appointed. I had a bitterly disappointing interview in which the BBC's director-general, John Burt, gave the impression that my long service with the BBC would not necessarily be an advantage. Robin Oakley and I settled down as best we could. It was never an easy relationship, although he was a thoughtful, kind professional with long experience at Westminster. My colleagues realised, of course, that potentially our relationship was explosive, and there was general delight when the story went round of how I responded to Robin's first major broadcasting disaster. He dried up, on air. We've all nearly done that, I was reported to have told him. Unfortunately, this became the defining story of our relationship. 
If Mrs. Thatcher should have had the initials ERM engraved on her heart, it would not be a bad idea to do the same for Mr. Major. When he was Chancellor, Mr. Major's greatest achievement was persuading Mrs. Thatcher that Britain should join the European exchange rate mechanism. I remember him telling me some weeks before it happened that the Rubicon has been crossed. Two years later, when Mr. Major had become Prime Minister and the pound was ejected from the ERM, it was one of the biggest setbacks suffered by a British government in peacetime. It paved the way for a massive Labour victory at the next election. Whichever way Mr. Major turned, the subject always seemed to come back to Europe. His own views were increasingly difficult to ascertain. He began with a clear declaration saying he wanted Britain to be at the very heart of Europe. Later, with considerable skill, he negotiated the Maastricht Treaty, managing to ensure that Britain could opt out of the single currency. In the autumn of 1992, on his chartered plane flying back from Egypt, after celebrating the 50th anniversary of the Battle of El Alamein, he gave me a passionate defence of the Maastricht Treaty. After about ten minutes, I said, well, why does anyone think of you as anything but a strong pro-European? He looked at me as if I had said something quite shocking. But John, he said, I am the biggest Eurosceptic in the Cabinet. For most of his time in office, he was forced to sit on the fence over Europe, and he never found it comfortable. When John Smith died in May 1994, the shock was felt throughout Westminster. Much to his credit, Mr. Major put aside political advantage and led the nation in mourning. But politics never stand still. The news of John Smith's death came officially at 10.30 a.m., and very quickly the corridors buzzed with private comment about who might become the new Labour leader. Peter Mandelson was the unofficial cheerleader for two of the most promising candidates, Tony Blair and Gordon Brown. So... Who should it be, Mr. Mandelson asked me, as he waited to be interviewed on the lunchtime programmes. For me, this was not the burning question. It would not feature in the first broadcasts announcing the death of John Smith. I was struck by the difference between those who are in the political world and those who report it. I did my best to reply. Tony Blair and Gordon Brown would both be good. And then, after a short pause, I said, I suppose it'll be Tony Blair. He did not comment, but significantly, he did not argue against me. It was the beginning of an anguished period for Mr. Mandelson. He did back Tony Blair, but in doing so produced a sharp rift between himself and Gordon Brown, which even years after serving in the government remained as deep as ever. The contest for the leadership also changed forever the relationship between Mr. Brown and Mr. Blair. They were never again each other's greatest friend in politics, and there were always serious tensions between them. I did not know Mr. Blair well. Not long before Mr. Smith died, Mr. Blair and I had lunch at Quaglino's, but it was not a very enlightening occasion. He was extremely personable, and he seemed happily married, worrying about whether he had a wedding anniversary gift for his wife, Cherie. I would have been happier if he could have made clear where he wanted the country to go, but he was so convinced of the iniquities of the Tories, the details of what Labour might do seemed rather beside the point. I had a closer relationship with Gordon Brown, perhaps helped by the fact that we were both sons of clergymen. On a visit he made to the United States, just before the general election of 1997, I was the only journalist travelling in his party.